So after four years of investigating the FBI's investigation into possible collusion between the Trump 2016 campaign and Russia, special counsel John Durham released his findings yesterday. A 300-page report, and in it, Durham, who was first appointed by then-Attorney General William Barr in 2019, accuses the Bureau of acting negligently but did not reveal any bombshells, as many Republicans had long claimed he would. Durham found no evidence the Justice Department and the FBI conspired in a deep state plot to investigate Trump's ties to Russia in 2016. In addition, Durham did not recommend any wholesale changes at the FBI. The special counsel also appears to relitigate two of the cases he lost that went to trial in which he brought criminal charges. The Durham report has been contradicted by two other reports, including one released in 2020 by the Republican-led Senate Intelligence Committee. The committee's report, as well as one from a Justice Department watchdog, found the FBI's investigation has some flaws but was warranted and said the Trump campaign posed a counterintelligence risk to the U.S. by opening itself to foreign Influence. Let's bring in right now Washington correspondent for the New York Times, Michael Schmidt. Michael, this is a four-year investigation investigating the investigators. This is a guy that got humiliated time and time again. Uh, Trump newspapers and Trump TV networks got humiliated by following a lot of uh, sort of the breadcrumbs that he sprinkled around. And time and time again, he had nothing to show for it. Now there seems to be this argument that, oh, well, you know, the FBI, that Republicans want to defund the FBI because they even launched this investigation. I want to go back and just underline what, what Mika just said there. Uh, this is from 2020 uh, after Marco Rubio's Senate Intelligence Committee put out their report. Uh, the report's language is often uh, stark, describing Trump's uh, campaign uh, to Russian outreach as a, quote, grave counterintelligence threat. Let, let me say, say that again. Uh, describing Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort's receptivity to Russian outreach as a, quote, grave counterintelligence threat that made the campaign susceptible to, quote, malign Russian influence. This was Marco Rubio and other members of the Republican Senate committee, the Intel committee, saying this. Uh, and yet the conclusions that are drawn here Again, it really seemed to, it's just seems to be a complete dud. Once again, another dud by John Durham. You, you raise an interesting point there at the end about the Senate Intelligence Committee report that was put out by Marco Rubio. That was among the most damning documents that came out about Trump's ties to Russia. And it had been put out by, by Rubio, who was in charge of the committee at the time. Um, I've never really understood the Durham investigation. To me, it seemed like a way of the Justice Department trying to buy off Trump and tell him that they were doing something to look into these allegations that had come up throughout his administration about what had gone wrong inside the Russia investigation. It always seemed to me like that type of inquiry, that type of look at how the FBI, you know, proceeded would be done by an inspector general to sort of look and say, OK, we did a massive, really important politically charged investigation. Here's what we did right and here's what we did wrong. And I think what what really hurt Durham in the end is the fact that he brought these two cases to court against these two individuals in connection with the dossier and lost. And we talk a lot these days about what it means for a prosecutor to lose or the potential for a prosecutor to lose. And in the case of Durham, we saw what that meant because it really took a lot of the air out of his investigation. It allowed those who had been critical and skeptical of the investigation to look at it and say, well, what was this really all about? And when he went to trial and had to air his evidence, it, it didn't really it didn't really hold up in a way 
that certainly lived up to the expectations that Trump had set for the Durham investigation. He had trumpeted this thing. He had talked about it publicly and, and privately and really was banking on it as helping him win re-election all the way back in 2020. So, Michael, we should also underline that the Justice Department in 2019, the Inspector General Michael Horowitz, launched its own investigation and found that, yes, there were flaws in the way that the FBI did its investigation, but ultimately that the investigation was warranted. Um, and so the FBI made changes, and they said that yesterday in response. They said, yes, Mr. Durham, we know all of this. We took this into account several years ago, and we've made changes into what we're doing here. So at the end of the day, for people watching who are trying to remember everything that got us here over the last, what, seven years or something like that, what is the takeaway? What is the end result of all of this? What do we know about collusion or alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians? I, I think what, what we know is that the Trump campaign invited this help from the Russians. We know from our own eyes and from watching that Donald Trump asked Russia to help him. He did that very publicly and in doing so brought a lot of these questions on himself. It's, I, you know, pe you know, people will will say, oh, you know, the, the media did this or the FBI did this or such. But it was Donald Trump on the campaign stump that asked Russia, you know, if you're listening to try and help find Hillary Clinton's emails. And I always go back to that moment because if you were the FBI in 2016 or you were an average American watching this or you were a member in the media, it was hard to look at the fact that he had invited that help, along with the fact that Russia was actively attacking the American democracy, and sort of say, well, what's really going on here? So it, it required people, it, you know, people said, well, 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 what's the real answer? So a lot of people in a lot of different ways went out to try and answer that question. And there were different things that were going on. Trump was trying to deal, uh, do a deal with, with, you know, in Russia at the time through Michael Cohen. Uh, Trump's son, Don Jr., meets with these Russians during the campaign about dirt that they said that they had on Hillary Clinton. Uh, you ultimately have the first national security advisor of Trump uh, lying to the FBI about his contacts with the Russians um, and then going to court to plead guilty to that. So there, there were a lot of different things that, that came out in this period of time that, that were curious and that, as an average citizen, were difficult to look at and say, OK, I can accept that on face value. Washington correspondent for The New York Times, Michael Schmidt, thank you very much for your reporting this morning. And it appears Ron DeSantis is inching closer to launching a presidential campaign. A Republican Party official confirmed to NBC News the Florida governor's political operation is officially moving out of the party headquarters in Tallahassee. Trucks were seen outside the building yesterday. This move is expected to cost more than $5,000. If DeSantis's office spends that much money, they must file a report within 15 days officially declaring his candidacy so we could be upon it. Meanwhile, DeSantis is ramping up his attacks against Donald Trump. During a press conference yesterday, the Florida governor brought up the Republican Party's losing streak while Trump is in office. Well, I look at the last however many election cycles, 2018, we lost the House, we lost the Senate. 2020, Biden becomes president, or no, excuse me, we lost the Senate in 2020, Biden becomes president and has done a huge amount of damage, very unpopular in 2022, and we were supposed to have this big red wave, and other than like Florida and Iowa, I didn't see a red wave across this country. And so I think the party has uh, developed a, a culture of losing. I think that there's uh, not uh, accountability, and I think in Florida we really showed what it takes uh, to not just win, win big, and then deliver big. Okay. He doesn't do it as well as you, but that's okay. Thank he you. does it. Thank you, dear. No, I mean, you just got the list. and I mean, actually, you're very, just please don't do it again. 
Okay. It's so hard. But he kind of keeps getting, he wavers off. But the bottom line is it's a losing streak and no. he hopes to break it. Willie, they've just lost so much. I mean, this is, it seems to me this is a good tag for DeSantis. He does need to punch it up when he starts campaigning, talking about, hey, I, I hate losing. I don't, I don't want to be, yeah, it's a culture of losing in the Republican Party. Donald Trump lost to, you punch it up. But that's actually a really good message because yeah. I think most Republicans, most Republicans would re would prefer winning to, and I won't go through the list. Thank you. To losing like they I did, it, you Joe. know. Go ahead. 17, 18, 19, <laughs> 20, 21, 22, 23, and some massive losses, a massive loss in 23. Uh, in Wisconsin, a massive loss in Kansas in 22, a massive loss in Kentucky uh, in, in 22 on, on abortion. Uh, and then, of course, a massive loss, even Florida, I mean, even governorships across the Deep South in Kentucky and Louisiana in those off years. Like, yeah, they're losing the big races, but they're losing the smaller races, too, because, again, Trumpism does not scale. In fact, it pushes people away. I, I keep having it. I know it's anecdotal, but I just keep talking to, to Republicans. Yeah. Keep talking to them. And, and, you know, I used to, my anecdotal evidence was always, well, you know, they don't care what he does. They're going to vote for him anyway. Not that way anymore. Over the past three, four months, it's broken dramatically away from him. And again, people aren't saying it to me to make me feel good because they're the same ones who said, they're voting for a guy who accused me of murder because of regulations. So, <laughs> I mean, so these people talk straight. And what they're saying now is he's going to lose. He has too much going on. He's, he's got too many cases going on. He's too crazy on social media. They just want thank him for his service, but they want him in the rearview mirror. This is a potent message that Ron DeSantis could push. Joe, I think you're absolutely right, and especially, I would submit, after that CNN town hall last week, where even yes. Republicans, independents, we talked about, even Republicans go, ugh, not again, not again. So the question now, the open question is, what's the alternative? And maybe it is Ron DeSantis. This is happening, by the way. The moving trucks are in Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. Governor DeSantis' press secretary quit yesterday, stepped down, I should say, to say, mm -hmm. moving on to pursue other opportunities to continue to drive Governor DeSantis' messages across the country. So you can read into that what you will. So Ron DeSantis is getting in the race. I guess the question, Jonathan Lemire, is, is the culture of losing argument potent enough in a Republican primary? to win. Can he beat Donald Trump with that? Reminding voters, look at the record under Donald Trump. We keep losing. We want power. We want to change the country and our vision. We need power to do that. And Donald Trump has cost us that and he'll do it again in 2024. Will that be enough? There are those in the Republican Party that are do want to turn the page on Donald Trump who say electability has always been Governor Sanders' best argument. And that's why they've been so dismayed that he has fought culture war after culture war, whether it's against Disney and you know, it's the abortion restrictions and so on, that they feel like that's hurting that argument. They feel like he is when he does that, he is pitching himself to a smaller slice of the electorate because what you just heard there from the governor is a fairly clever way to attack Trump's record without attacking Trump the person. And that is what so many of these Republicans have struggled with, is how do you distance yourself from Trump without either A, drawing his wrath, or B, alienating his voters. And by doing it this way, we are not taking on Trump personally, but simply saying, look, under his leadership, we've taken all these losses, losses we shouldn't have suffered. That might be a sort of clever way to do it. And we spent time on the show yesterday talking about some of these state polls that show DeSantis fares much better than Trump in head-to-head -head matchups against Biden, including in some states, Joe, that really haven't been on the map for Republicans in a long time, things like Virginia and Colorado. So there's a lot here we don't know yet about DeSantis. He'll need to be vetted on a national stage. Yes, he had a good weekend in Iowa, but the, his pseudo campaign has been off to a shaky start. But he may have stumbled onto something that has a shot of working. It is so early. It is so early. Let me once again say that in July of 2007, uh, when they were even further along in, in the presidential process than they are right than we are right now, uh, people were writing John McCain's obituaries uh, in newspapers, political obituaries, saying there's no way he could win the Republican primary. 
he came back and won the Republican primary. Caddy K, though, you know, Willie brought up the town hall meeting uh, it, 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 the other night, CNN. I'm, that's another thing I'm hearing from Republicans. And they're saying specifically, I'm not voting for that man. And we've been talking about women, the decision makers in the suburbs of Atlanta, the suburbs of Philly, the suburbs of Detroit, the suburbs of Milwaukee. And what did they see during the town hall meeting? They saw a man responsible, actually, for taking away of, of, of the half century of their own rights over their own bodies to make their own medical decisions. They saw him mocking and ridiculing a woman that a jury unanimously declared uh, a woman who was sexually assaulted by Donald Trump. And that night he mocked her. And that night he once again went back and said, Maybe it's not a bad thing that stars like me have been able to sexually assault women Se yeah, for millions liable of, of years. For millions of years, which, of course, we'll let him talk to his favorite scientists there. But, but again, the support keeps getting smaller because he keeps going out of his way, offending the very people that he needs to bring back on his side if he wants to win. Today, the Republican-led North Carolina legislature is preparing to vote to override a veto of its abortion ban. The state House Speaker's chief of staff tweeted out the timing for the vote yesterday. The ban prohibits abortions after 12 weeks, with some exceptions for rape, incest, or to save the mother's life. Democratic Governor Roy Cooper vetoed the legislation, but Republicans hold a slim supermajority in the House and could override his decision. Republicans achieved that supermajority just last month when then Democratic Representative Tricia Cotham switched parties. She then voted in favor of the abortion ban. Republicans will likely need every single member of their party to vote to override the veto, something that's not necessarily assured. And Governor Cooper joins us now. Uh, first of all, Governor, do you think Republicans will be able to override your veto? Well, they certainly intend to, but we know that a number of Republicans promised their constituents that they would mm -hmm. protect women's reproductive freedom. And we've been pushing this last week to get people in their district, uh, people they may know, like ministers and doctors and friends, to tell them to keep their promise and have the courage to stand up to the Republican leadership. Uh, they only have a one-vote supermajority in the House and a one-vote supermajority in the Senate. And all we need is one Republican to stand up mm -hmm. in either chamber to stop this bad ban in North Carolina. I mean, do you have any? I mean, what happens if, if they get the numbers? Well, obviously, we would have a disastrous abortion ban come into effect in North Carolina. We would do everything we could through the courts, through rulemaking, uh, to try to blunt the damage. But this legislation was billed as a reasonable compromise, and it's not. Uh, it cuts off medication abortion at 10 weeks. It creates obstacle courses for women having mm -hmm. to be in person three times to be able to obtain medication abortion. And this hurts uh, many women who live in rural areas, who are poor, who work hourly jobs, who are already mothers. Uh, we already have become an access point in the South for many women because of the restrictive bans passed in other states. This has created waiting lists. And we know that with this compressed time period, with the cost that it takes a woman to be able to get there and the time, uh, this is going to effectively ban abortions for many women in North Carolina, even inside of 12 weeks. This is not Absolutely. the kind of thing we need. <laughs> Right-wing politicians yeah. should not be in the exam room with women and their doctors. And we need to leave the medicine to doctors and the decisions to women. And in North Carolina, uh, we have been able to protect women's reproductive freedom for four years because I've been able to veto all of the bad bills. We've had enough Democrats to sustain those vetoes for the first time now because of this 
party switch and because of the last elections, we are facing a supermajority in North Carolina by one vote. Let's just hope that party politics doesn't rule the day here. And let's hope yeah. that one of these Republicans will decide to do the right thing, do what they know is right. This legislation was kept under lock and key, was introduced in the middle of the night, was passed 42 hours later with no amendments allowed, with no mm -hmm. public input. How is that a reasonable compromise? It's obviously not. And it, it only took Governor, him 42 hours to turn the clock back 50 years. And that's frustrating for people in North Carolina. It's not what we want. I want to ask you about that party switch you mentioned. Um, we, we mentioned the lawmaker that gave North Carolina Republicans a supermajority. Uh, this is Representative Tricia Cotham. And she was a Democrat and just switched parties. But long before her switch, here she is in 2015 talking about her own past abortion. Take a look. The time-sensitive medical process, procedures that I had to endure began immediately. And it was awful. And it didn't work. This decision was up to me, my husband, my doctor, and my God. It was not up to any of you in this chamber. So that woman who made the case for her own health care and her own abortion voted in favor of this ban. She be has become a Republican and voted in favor of this ban. What happened? Well, and that same access would be denied to many women in North Carolina. Uh, and in fact, earlier in the year, she was one of all of the Democrats who sponsored legislation to codify Roe v. Wade, which, of course, never got a hearing in the supermajority Republican legislature. I don't know what happened. She had talked about wanting more freedom of thought. Well, now it's time to have that freedom of thought. This is obviously something that she has cared about for a long time. And what I'm hoping is that she will stand up to her new party, just like she stood up to her old one, and do the right thing, do what her constituents want. This is a largely blue Democratic district, and you need to keep your promises. But that also goes for other Republicans. This, this legislation was meant as a disguise. Mm. Uh, they call it a reasonable 12-week ban in order to protect all of these Republicans who promised to protect reproductive freedom. But in fact, when you get into the details of the bill, with all of the burdens and restrictions and hoops that women have to jump through, and that doctors have to jump through, and that clinics have to jump through, we know that this is going to operate as an effective ban for many women in our state. And it's not right. These politicians should not be making these decisions. These decisions no. should be left mm. to women. And in North Carolina, we're going to fight and continue to fight for women. We will never, ever back down when it comes to women's health. Governor, polls suggest that 57% of North Carolinians either want to keep the existing 20-week limit or actually want access to abortion extended. So how do you account for the fact that the Republican legislature seems to be so out of step with what voters in your state want? Technologically diabolical super gerrymandering. North Carolina probably has some of the worst gerrymandered districts in the country. And therefore, I can get elected statewide, yet you see a supermajority legislature in, in, in our state. Uh, and in fact, when our state Supreme Court last year said that these partisan gerrymanders were in violation of our state constitution and had to redraw the congressional maps, they ended up being seven Democrats and seven Republicans that we've sent to Washington. Now we have a Republican Supreme Court that has turned that on its head. And this legislature is now busy redistricting legislative seats as well as congressional seats. And I fear that we're going to see uh, super gerrymandered districts across the board. We need independent 
redistricting commissions. I've promised many times that if Democrats ever get control, we're going to institute uh, independent commissions. Uh, there's no perfect way to draw districts, but this is not the right way to do it because it no. clearly does not reflect what the people of North Carolina think on this issue and many others. We're having a battle over public education right now in our state. Uh, they're trying to choke public education with private school vouchers for millionaires and cutting taxes. Uh, it, can, it goes on and on, and, it, and it's frustrating. But we're going to fight every single day in this state. We have the, one of the best states in the country. Uh, we're the number one state in the country for business. We believe that we're going we're gonna to continue to work to do the best that we can to protect women's health in our state. Democratic Governor Roy Cooper of North Carolina, thank you very much. We'll be watching. And now to a new push for solutions this morning on the ongoing battle to reverse the harmful effects of climate change. Some of the world's top climate activists and leaders are meeting in Vienna right now for the Austrian World Summit. It's an annual conference aimed at promoting new ideas to combat the climate crisis. And it's part of the Schwarzenegger Climate Initiative created by former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. He just wrapped up his keynote address at this year's conference a short time ago, and he joins us now. Mr. Schwarzenegger, thank you so much for being on the show this morning. We'd like to hear uh, what you're hoping to accomplish in this conference. And also, if you could talk about climate change in its relation to the war in Ukraine and what people need to know. Well, uh, first of all, let me say thank you very much for having me. And uh, we are just in the middle of this conference right now. It started this morning. And, uh, you know, like you said, I gave the keynote speech here. And uh, it's always wonderful to bring everyone of the environmental movement together here from all over the world and to talk about the kind of things that we can do to move the agenda forward and to get off fossil fuels. <clears throat> and the whole theme today, my theme of the speech was that we got to go and speed up the process of getting things built. And I'm not just talking about any kind of infrastructure, highways, freeways, tunnels, bridges, and all this kind of stuff, but I'm talking about green projects, infrastructure that has to do with energy, because there's thousands and thousands of, of, of projects that are being held up in America and that are held up here in Europe, which is through, uh, you know, kind of bureaucracy and uh, lawsuits and uh, papers and studies and all of this kind of stuff, all the crap that really holds things up for years and years and years. So it takes four or five years to get a, a green project built, like a solar, something that takes up to 10 years in Europe to get, uh, you know, uh, windmills built. So the only way we can really replace fossil fuels, which is a killer, which kills 7 million people a year, is with renewable energy or nuclear energy, one or the other. But the bottom line is that we got to go and speed up the building process because in, in America, we have 2,000 gigawatts, 2,000 gigawatts of energy, clean energy, waiting to be built, except it needs the permits. And so the, just to show you how much energy this is, we use daily around 1,200 gigawatts in America. So here we're talking about 2,000 gigawatts. They are ready to be built, but we need the permit. So in Europe, they have the same problem. In America, we have the problem. So what I'm saying is the new environmentalism should all be about let's build and let's be aggressive about moving forward so we can replace fossil fuels. Governor, it's great to have you on the show this morning. Since you are there with some of the leaders from around the world on climate change, the future of energy, what are some of the exciting ideas that you're hearing at the conference as you sit there today? There's so much going on in the world. It's clear where everything is headed. There are obviously some lobbies and some interest groups that are trying to slow down that progress for, for their own reasons. But what are you hearing there that gives you hope, gives you promise that we're headed in the right direction? Well, I think that it gives me hope uh, that we will move forward with the building process and with the permitting process. As a matter of fact, as you know, that President Biden right now is talking to the Republican Congress about that and negotiating about that in order to speed up that process. So I think there's some really good things happening in um, uh, here at the EU. In Europe, they already moved forward and they already changed and they reformed the process. So they're speeding up the process. So I think that people are hearing this. 
uh, in an emergency loud and clear because we are in an emergency. And an emergency means that you can't always just get everything perfect, but you can go and move forward. And that's exactly what I'm stressing to do. I call for new environmentalism. Uh, we understand that the old environmentalists and environmentalism kind of was afraid of building because it meant more pollution and more death and stuff like that. But this is the new environmentalism where we have the technology now and we know that, for instance, that solar and wind is much cheaper now than coal. So let's go and replace coal with those kind of elements, with this kind of energy. That's where, what I'm trying to do. But when it comes to technology in general, Joe, I think that it is really exciting when you see that in 2005 when we had the car show in Los Angeles when I was governor, we had one electric car. Now we have, in the latest uh, car show, we had over 50 electric cars. So now every company, every car company in the world is building electric cars and hydrogen cars. So the technology is now changing really fast. There's all kinds of great things that are happening when it comes to technology. So if we fail with this whole thing, it's not going to be a failure of technology and of innovation. It's going to be a failure of our inaction. Mr. Schwarzenegger, there seem to be climate conferences almost every week at the moment. Of course, there's the big UN one, the COP one. What is your gathering in Vienna adding to the equation? What do you bring to the table that perhaps others are not able to do? How can you move the political needle? Because it is a political needle, not a technological needle, as you've pointed out. What can you do that others can't? It's a, a, a communication needle. It's actually not a political uh, you know, needle. It's a communication needle. As, as, as long as we talk about uh, climate change, which most of the conferences do, and by the way, I have to say, it's great to have all those conferences all over the world. It's no different than when we, had, when we promoted the fitness movement in the 70s. The more we talked about fitness and the more we talked about weight training and about cross training and all of those things, the more people got involved. And now, of course, exactly what I predicted then, that there would be eventually more, you know, uh, uh, grocery stores and supermarkets than, uh, I mean, more, more gymnasiums than supermarkets. That's exactly what, ha what has happened. It's all because, you know, we promoted it and we talked about it for years. And the same is with this. We just have to talk about it. We have to have as many conferences, write as much about it, do speeches and on and on and on. But the, the, the difference between our event is very simple. We talk about things that most people are afraid to talk about. We talk about the things that, that the mistakes that are being made within the environmental movement, like, for instance, communication. When people talk about climate change, it doesn't really mean anything to anybody. So you have to talk about what causes climate change. It's pollution. So let's talk about pollution. Everyone understands pollution. Everyone understands when you say there's health threats there. Like when, we, when I was governor of California, we talked about pollution and how many kids have asthma in the Central Valley in California. And that really connected with the people. Climate change didn't connect with the people. Pollution connected with the people. The threat of getting sick, uh, their kids getting sick, them dying because of pollution. That's what connected. And that's how we were able to move and, uh, and, and pass so many great environmental laws in California. So we want to do this worldwide. We want to let people know, try to communicate a little different, try to include in your dialogue pollution and about, you know, fossil fuels and how that kills people rather than just talk about climate, 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 climate. And everyone talks about climate, no one knows what the hell that is. So we got to communicate Governor. the right way. That's the most important thing. Any product that you have, you have to communicate to the people and you have to promote it and market it the right way. Uh, Governor, this is David Ignatius in, in Washington. You're there in, in Austria, uh, literally almost next door. Uh, a frightful war is going on in, in Ukraine. Uh, this last night, there was, there was terrible bombing uh, in, in the city. I'm just wondering what you, as a, as a, as a European uh, at the start of your life, uh, feel as you're watching this going on. What, what thoughts you'd send to the Ukrainian people? What, what thoughts you'd send to Russia? Well, we had the mayor, Mayor Klitschko from, you know, Ukraine, I mean, uh, uh, from Kiev. He was on our show today and he was part of our environmental conference. And uh, it's really sad to hear his stories. And it's really sad when you just turn on the news, you turn on the news and you just listen to those kind of sad stories. How, uh, you know, a country that was uh, attacked unprovoked and, uh, you know, and, and it just it has this unbelievable effect and how many people have to die. And then sad stories, not only Ukrainian people have to die, but Russian people have to die. And they don't even know what the hell is happening there. So it's, 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 it's just sad. And I hope that someone amongst the leadership in the world comes up with a solution to have them both sit down and start not negotiating and talk 
and come to this kind of a peace agreement. Arnold Schwarzenegger, thank you very, very much for coming on the show this morning. Uh, we look forward to hearing more about the conference. We appreciate it. And the CEO of the company behind ChatGPT will testify before Congress today. A Senate Judiciary Subcommittee will discuss the oversight of artificial intelligence to gain a better understanding of the risks posed by the technology. This as officials attempt to crack down on the spread of misinformation and ensure consumers' privacy. Joining us now, former CIA officer Mark Polymeropoulos. He's an NBC News security and intelligence analyst and professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke University, Dan Ariely. He's the author of the book entitled The Honest Truth about dishonesty. It's good to have you both. Thank you guys for being with us, Dan. You know, it, it seems that many in the media, many in politics for the past eight years have been trying to figure out how to push back on disinformation. When I go uh, to Washington, uh, I've, I've talked to Democrats on both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue throughout that time. They've been just absolutely dumbfounded as to how to respond to these fire hose of falsehoods. And now, with AI, the pace is only quickening. So what's the answer? What is the truth about uh, disinformation and how do we fight it? So first of all, I think we do need to understand the problem. And if we think about what mm. you said earlier about uh, Trump in a particular case, uh, when Trump was running originally for elections, uh, we were all surprised by how many uh, things he was saying that were not, that were not truth. And I started looking at it at the time because it looked like he was saying all these things that were not truth. <clears throat> Democrats were outraged and Republicans didn't seem to matter so much, didn't seem to care so much. And I looked into it and what I found was that Republicans wanted a, a leader that would lie. Now, what I don't mean that they want a liar, uh, but they wanted somebody who would show loyalty to their team. They wanted a dirty player who would get their agenda up. When Trump, when Trump won, this was a very ideological election. Uh, people on the left wanted things, people on the right wanted things. And basically the people who were Trump supporters, many of them said, I know the guy is unethical, but he's such an unethical guy that when he gets to power, he will make sure that our agenda is being carried over. And the ends justify the means. It's perfectly fine to be to be uh, slightly to shade things because we have things that are right now more. Later, maybe we'll go back to the truth. But right now, this is this is more important. And in uh, the last Mark, few years, Mark. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. Let me interrupt. Go ahead. Finish up. No, no, it's fine. And, and in the last few years, things have been much more ideological. If you if you look at the Republicans who still say that Trump won the most recent election, uh, some of them are saying it, not really believing it, but saying it is a stamp of loyalty. If I say something so extreme uh, that is not true, then I'm uh, signaling my loyalty to the group, that I'm really, I'm, I'm really part of this. So, Mark, let's talk a little further about the dangers here uh, of, of this misinformation or disinformation, uh, and particularly when it comes to AI. We've already seen some of the deep fakes that are out there um, that are, I would say, at this point, mm, they're like 90 percent of the way there. A careful study, you can usually tell if it's not quite right, but the technology is improving so quickly, it's going to be a matter of time uh, before they are spot on. And who knows what they can depict, let's just say, a political rival saying or doing or, you know, that could be very, very damaging and used uh, for, for great uh, harm. Uh, what is your level of concern that we, we may be at that era sooner than perhaps we expected? Sure, Jonathan. So, uh, so I think with AI, you know, we are, we are at, a, at a place where there is tremendous, um, uh, you know, uh, positives that can come from this. Think about it in the national security and intelligence spheres where you have things like artificial intelligence and algorithms that can help us with logistics, that can talk about maintenance of systems. When you think about <clears throat> intelligence, you think about, you know, this, this collection of data, algorithms that, that can help us analyze, for example, imagery from across the world. So really positives. But then there's the negatives. And the deep fakes, I think, is something that we should worry about both internationally and, and at home here. And I think on the international side, look, we're going to see our adversaries use deep fakes. China has a mass 
uh, a program on AI. So what happens if, if China and, and, and Russia as well in their disinformation campaigns start using AI to promulgate themes inside this country? And of course, what happens inside the United States as well? So so huge concern. I think I, I think back to my time at, at CIA where we were battling Russian disinformation, particularly in Europe. And the, the mantra we had was, you know, the truth is going to be our superpower. And so you have to have a war room mentality, you know, whether it's it's a, a political campaign in the United States battling disinformation or, you know, the CIA, the NSA, the U.S. intelligence community battling the Russians and the Chinese. You have to have a war room mentality to push out the truth almost in real time when you see this coming at you. That's hard. That takes a lot of time, effort and money. But without that, you know, we're going to lose. Uh, and, and so, you know, something, again, of huge concern, uh, I think, in the national security uh, Sphere, and you're going to see on Congress a lot of people talking about this. There's committees all over the place uh, uh, now looking at AI and um, both, again, the positives and the negatives. Big issue for us. Dan, Mark there is talking about what governments and institutions can do to battle misinformation, but you've also found research on what individuals can do. I mean, it, it seems completely terrifying and throw in the mix of AI, the potential impact of this on voters and the way we vote in our polit political systems seems sort of almost, I think, out of people's control. But you suggest there are ways that we can combat misinformation on an individual level. Yeah. So, so first of all, I think that the individual level is the most frightening one. Because imagine a technology that identify your informational needs, identify your psychological state, and say what information would give you comfort while also giving you false information, right? It's almost like designing a virus that would fit our, our cognitive system in, in the best way. And by the way, um, you know, fake news can always be more interesting than the real news. Right, the moment you have the creativity to do whatever whatever you want, then then it's it's important. So so what are the what are the mechanisms? One of them is called pre-banking, where the idea is that when people consume fake news, it's already too late. The the, the moment we've consumed it, we have a very hard time separating uh, truth or fact, and and from there on we can deteriorate because once something becomes part of our cognitive structure, it's very hard for us to, to change it. So, so think about pre-banking. Pre How do we educate people in advance uh, to, to, be more, uh, to be more concerned, more worried, test things more deeply, and especially not spread it? You know, if people spread information without thinking, then it creates, every time I post something online, it puts my reputation on top of that information, and then it becomes uh, more, more logical. So that's one. The second thing, is that one of the main reasons, if you think about what's happening in American politics, if you think about the, the chase after fake information, a lot of it comes out of stress. You know, when, when the world seems that it's not going very well, that something is uh, against me, that uh, I'm feeling uh, hard done by, uh, we all look for somebody else to blame. Uh, we, we don't want to say, oh, it's my fault. We want to find something, somebody else uh, to blame. And therefore, we look, we look for that. So things like inequality, uh, things like a lower level of education, uh, think about uncertainty and trust. All of those create fertile ground for people to start going after uh, fake news. And then we have the internet uh, information bubble. Right. The, the social factors are basically what seals fake news. You go and you become friends with uh, people who believe the same beliefs that you do. Uh, you turn off the world outside of that. And, and then it's very, very hard to change uh, people after that. You know, Mark, it is it is extraordinary. The educated people, Willie and I talk about it all the time, the educated people that we know with advanced degrees that will spread the craziest conspiracy theories that they know to be false. They know them to be false. There's so many people that will go on a Chinese religious cult's website to read their favorite conspiracy theories. Even when you tell them, you realize there's a Chinese religious cult's website that they're putting out to reach Americans, and they tried being left-wing, and it wasn't as sticky as it was when they shifted to being a right-wing conspiracy. And even when you tell educated people with advanced degrees that, they still, they lap it up, and they share this information 
when they don't believe it. They know it's not true, but it appeals to their pre-existing prejudices. I mean, that is that that is pr pretty damning uh, and, and, and pretty difficult uh, habit to break uh, when democracies such as ours depend on the truth and depend on shared truths. Joe, you're right. So, you know, you and I share some some mutual friends, in fact, um, who, who have some kind of uh, political beliefs that I think have, have shifted and really are in these uh, information bubbles. You know, I was at a high school baseball game um, a couple nights ago, and I, and I sat down with a really good friend of mine who's really smart. Uh, uh, you know, uh, he's, a, he's a military officer. Um, and he looked at me and he said, oof, you know, really tough about that Biden crime family. And I, I turned around. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, well, you saw everything on the news. You know, there's smoke there. And I said, you can't really believe this. Now, this was, of course, the famous before the famous, you know, Red October uh, uh, incident with Representative Comer, when it looks like there is no, you know, witness or informants. Um, but but I thought a lot about that afterwards. And and I chose that day at the high school baseball game to get into a pretty heated argument about it. I pushed back. And I think that's something there's a lesson for everyone here, because people do live in these information bubbles. Um, but you got to push back when there when there's kind of nonsense. You have to take the time to kind of dissect people's arguments.